Hey folks, welcome to Bear Mountain. Uh, this this video is uh, we're just going to kind of go through and catch up a little bit about how things have been doing in this tunnel behind here on electroculture uh, versus non electroculture. Plus, we're going to take a walk over to our squash tunnel and show you a little bit of about how we're managing that one even totally different. So one of the things that we're doing is is we're rehabbing this tunnel. And I planted a mix in here of uh, buckwheat, which you can tell now is blooming. I'm going to have to get in here and kind of cut it down. But I really want the bees to kind of be able to work in here. Uh, and uh, they're really getting getting to the flowers. Um, this is near the end of August. And we planted some late season pumpkins. You can kind of see them in the background. And they're actually, um, I put a net over them. I should have took it off earlier. To prevent the deer from getting to him, but uh, interestingly, it's been kind of since the buckwheat's gotten to its size, the they've kind of the deer have kind of forgotten about the the pumpkins that are growing in the middle, and so we really haven't had uh, much damage at all. In the past, uh, I would have had deer in here just you know grinding these things down to nothing. So it's just a, uh, I guess maybe uh, they can't see it, so it isn't there, but. Uh, this is kind of going to be, uh, I'm going to be managing this tunnel a bit differently. I'm going to be using a lot of mulch and uh, cover crop. Uh, the cover crop will be its mulch itself. This was planted on top of a um, chop and drop of all the weeds and, and uh, blackberries and stuff in here that I cut out about a month ago, actually two months ago now. And then I mulched over the top with uh, straw, watered it well in, and then just broadly sowed the uh, buckwheat and the uh, cowpea cover crop and at first I didn't know if it would take off because I was sowing it over the top of of the uh, straw mulch um, but uh, clearly nature found a way and they were able to germinate and actually grow quite healthy uh, most of this buckwheat is uh, you know you can tell it's like three or four feet tall and it's not super thick but it's it's a nice cover crop so the next thing I'll do is I'm going to chop this down. We'll let the pumpkins grow over the top of it uh, a bit. Uh, probably be chopping this in the next week or so. And, and then I'm going to be planting a fall cover crop in here of uh, cereal rye and annual rye and um, some uh, field radish. Um, I'm going to try to get a mixture of things in here that will keep it, um, you know, kind of a diverse a group of plants and then just uh, overhead water to get it established and there's a more than enough soil moisture as it flows through here uh, underground in the winter time that once the roots are in the ground I anticipate I really won't have to water much in here at all and then next spring we'll chop and drop that and plant into it again uh, probably something of like uh, squashes and and things of that nature um, that can you know compete pretty vigorously so this is what the area looked like uh, before I sowed the buckwheat cover crop in the front. I did have a cover crop in here that I chopped and dropped a little earlier. I still got some remnants of buckwheat that kind of poke through. Uh, but uh, basically I just came in here with a scythe and cut it down, laid it down, and then I put uh, uh, grass straw that I cut earlier in the season over the top of it. And this, uh, I'll come back through here again. I got some weeds obviously poking through that I'll, I'll just come through here with the scythe and tidy it up. Uh, used to water this thing exclusively on drip irrigation, but I think I'm gonna be moving away from that using more of a sprinkler-based system. So we're back in the tunnel with the tomatoes and the melons and the cucumbers. And some of the questions that uh, I know have been posted on some of the previous videos have to do with, well, how the harvest is starting to go and whether electroculture is making a difference. The tomato harvest is just getting started. I've gotten some of the lower tomatoes you can kind of see there starting to ripen up. Um, but I've got a lot of a lot of fruit set on the electroculture side, uh, which is substantially more than what's on the non-electroculture side. So uh, what I'm kind of thinking I'm seeing here is, is that uh, I'm getting better fruit set, but at the same time, I've still got some issues with uh, blossom end rot like here's an example uh, and this is has to do with calcium in the soil and that's my own mistake I should have really uh, uh, put more 
uh, calcium based uh, fertilizers on early on and when I plant it as well as as um, you know supplement things I think what I'll do is I'll do a foliar feed of of uh, the extract of uh, calcium from eggshell and uh, that's that vinegar extract where you use roasted eggshells and uh, we did a video on that on how to make it with uh, vinegar uh, basically uh, extracting the calcium into a, a plant soluble calcium acetate and then using that at a, a, a 1 to 1000 dilution as a foliar spray and I'm thinking that that will help uh, some of it on, on some of the later fruit setting on the earlier fruit didn't really seem to have any blossom end rot it's it's the later when things are maybe a little more stressed uh, as they got closer to the top of uh, the tunnel, maybe it's a little hotter up there, but I kind of seem to have more rot in the tomatoes uh, on that. Uh, the amount of rot on the electric culture side versus the non-electric culture side at this point, it's kind of indeterminate. Um, it looks to me about to be about the same. The other thing you might note is that the marigolds are just doing fantastic. These are all uh, direct sown, and then I just... Uh, I transplanted uh, to space them out, and uh, they really did a good job. And so far, I haven't seen really any kind of bugs in here uh, of any consequence. So the insect level is way, way down from what I think I would have expected. Like, this tunnel has very few cucumber beetles in it, which is surprising because I've got all these melons over here on the other side. Um, and I think in general, um, the electroculture, the marigolds... Um, Maybe just dumb luck, uh, but I've got a tunnel that's less than uh, 40 feet away, and it's got cucumber beetles in it, and this one doesn't. So here's another example of blossom end rot, unfortunately. But, um, you know, I've got a, quite a few, and I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick these guys out, the ones that have rot. This one's outside of the electroculture uh, from about this point uh, backwards. Um, so I don't know how much I'm going to lose here and it, it, I mean, it's not consistent. Not all of them have it, but you know, like here's an example. I got two of them right next to each other. One's got it, one doesn't. Um, but I'm probably going to end up losing about 30% of, uh, of my tomato harvest, which is really kind of sad. It's kind of my own stupid mistake, you know, but I think I can stop it from getting worse. Like I said, with the uh, calcium treatment peppers, on the other hand, they're, not as green. This is outside of the electroculture zone. All the peppers are. So I think um, they're definitely lacking some minerals in here. Um, it's not, it doesn't look like a nitrogen shortage per se, but I'm kind of thinking that it's just a, it, it could use a boost. Probably I should have fertilized them more than I did, but I've got a lot of fruit setting on. And so um, I'm still going to get a pretty decent harvest off of these guys. What's also amazing about these uh, marigolds is usually had a lot of uh, foliar damage due to cucumber beetles and there is nothing in here chewing on these and no no bites on the blossoms of anything. That's pretty wild. Over here we have our sweet potato. This is, uh, we've got about uh, 15 different uh, plants in here. Of uh, They're all the same variety. They were just taken from a sweet potato from the store and we raised some slips off it. Um, I think, you know, the plants are doing well. I guess it'll just be interesting to see how the roots go. Okay, so here are the cucumbers. We've got four hills of three plants in each hill. I've got a couple of different varieties. Uh, this one right here is, is a slicer, and it's, um, I think it's called Diva. And it uh, produces kind of a, a very smooth... Uh, fruit with not as many spines on it. I mean, here's an example. I got another one to pick today Like this guy right here. You can kind of see uh, It almost looks a little bit like a zucchini. Let me just get that off of here so um, When you look at it if I can Hopefully it's clear. It really is a nice slicer uh, Kind of a thin skin. I think it's got a got a characteristics of like an Armenian cucumber in it It's like a not as burpy now you wouldn't want to make a pickle out of this because the skin of it's too thin and uh, it would probably it would just make a soft kind of mushy uh, pickle but then I've got over here right next to it um, this is a variety called a uh, small leaf and 
I just haven't got the production off of this that I have off of Max Packs, which is my next uh, couple of hills. And I've picked uh, so far off of the Max Pack, uh, which we have two, two hills of that. And um, so that would be six total plants. Just yesterday, I picked 18 pounds of um, cucumbers off of it, and that was that was my third picking of about that size. So uh, we planted these guys, uh, direct seeded them in uh, early June, and uh, today is the 20th of August, and they're actually um, I've I've put up so far we have put up uh, 30 jars uh, pints of of uh, sliced pickles and I've made several uh, batches of uh, dill pickles uh, using a lacto fermentation and I can see that I still have more cucumbers I mean here's an example this is a max pack um, this is the perfect size I mean look at that guy it's got a nice skin it's a bit spiny but um, these guys make great pickles and uh, I mean, it's, fat, it's amazing how fast they keep coming on. I'll just take these up and eat them for a snack. But uh, it's really, they've produced very, very well. And I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the small leaf one next year. And just for all my picklers, I'm just going to go to Max Pack. They seem to produce pretty well. I do like, I do like the Diva flavor for the slicer. Um, and... Uh, they don't tend to get as big as fast, you know, sometimes you get these cucumbers and if you miss them, the next thing you know, they're a, a bodor. Um, they, they tend to kind of hit a certain size and um, the flavor still stays pretty good even when they get a bit larger. Now all of these uh, cucumbers um, from the Max Pack forward uh, and the cantaloupes are all under electroculture. So there, um, may, that could be a factor too, maybe in the productivity of the small leaf versus the max pack. Um, maybe that it has an effect on it. But um, these guys on the max pack are still putting out tons of blossoms. I mean, you can just kind of still see there's lots of male blossoms and female blossoms, and so they're still setting fruit. And I'm kind of getting to the point where. I've probably got my pickle stores for the year. So at some point, um, I'm going to probably thin these guys down to a level that I would uh, use for just uh, something else and keep a couple of slicer plants. And, you know, we'll, we've put up enough for the season. Now, the cantaloupes, <clears throat> these, these variety here is actually only one variety. It's called uh, Ice Cube. And it tends to be a smaller cantaloupe, like... Those guys are just getting started, some of those guys there. And you kind of got to hunt around in the foliage and you can find them. There's one right there. I don't know. I think I might have planted these cantaloupes too late. Uh, I still got, still probably going to have good weather for another month. So hopefully I will be eating cantaloupes in, um, we'll, we'll be able to get those guys harvested in the uh, month of September. Because once I get through September, I'm gonna, we're going to be uh, looking at, you know, day length. That's going to be uh, pretty, uh, well, there's a good size one right there. It's got the netting is starting to develop on it. So maybe it might, might not be too far off. We're having a bit of a cold August compared to previous August. Um, we're more down into the uh, high 70s and low 80s, and it's not so much the daytime temperature is a problem in the tunnel, it's the nighttime temps are actually getting down into the low 50s, which uh, is going to kind of slow things down. But you can see that the leaves of the plants are still pretty healthy. We don't see any mildew starting on them yet, uh, which is a good thing, because usually when you end up with these things where you have warm days and cool nights, you start getting mildew. And I haven't seen any of it yet, um, and that could be a factor uh, of just the fact that these plants are so super healthy at this point. So I've got a lot of uh, melons set on, uh, and, and the nice thing about the ice cube one is it's not a super big cantaloupe, so we're talking about something that's probably akin to maybe bigger than a softball, but uh, not much bigger than that, so it's nice for a meal. 
and it has a really nice flavor to it. And I've got a lot of melons set on those plants, so if we can get them to ripen up, um, we'll have quite a bit of uh, cantaloupe in uh, September. And so we're gonna figure out a way that we can <clears throat> maybe kind of uh, freeze some of it uh, using smoothies or something for um, you know coming up in the in the fall. Uh, or if there's a, you know, certain way that, um, you know, I don't know really anything more I can do other than kind of freeze it in chunks. I mean, you can't can cantaloupe because, well, that would be the, and I don't even think it's probably even safe. So, uh, basically we're just going to basically freeze the excess that we have and use it in uh, fruit salads or something, smoothies, whatever. And I actually am, I'm pretty impressed with the way things have been going. I mean, the tunnel is, is actually, you know, when you consider that this was all just, uh, you know, underneath a, uh, the, the landscape cloth with crates over the top of it for, you know, almost a good 10 years, uh, the soil is actually performing pretty well with, you know, some basic amendments that we did and uh, using the Jadam liquid fertilizer, and it, it actually performed really well. I think the electric culture also added a boost. Uh, I do have, you know, pretty good production off the Amish paste in the non-electric culture side, but um, I think it's it's not terribly much different than the electric culture side. It's going to be interesting to see what the weight differences are, you know, how much we lose to disease uh, versus, uh, you know, how much fruit set there is, that stuff. So, but I still think even with the losses with blossom and rot, we're still going to have uh, quite a bit of production. So that's it uh, for the, the two tunnels. Um, we have uh, some beans over in the other tunnel that haven't quite got uh, up to production level yet and corn over there, but uh, we're going to get ready to do some fall planting uh, in there. I want to do some peas and start putting our kale crops in and things of that. I'm going to do a lot more direct seeding in the tunnels than I am uh, to try to do transplants, except for I think on some of the things like lettuce and kale, I'll probably still do that uh, with transplants um, just because I want to make sure that I have, you know, enough. Uh, but other stuff like, um, you know, what we're going to be putting in is is some of the um, like carrots and things like that. Those are all going to be direct seeded. So I'll be kind of working that over the next couple of weeks. And uh, the corn is uh, now knee high by the end of August. So I don't know if that's really very good. But anyway, so folks, thanks for watching. Uh, stay safe out there and we'll catch you on the next video. Bye bye.